Oh man, what's going on, family? Uh, fighting some allergies. Uh, woo! It's all right. I feel the desire to keep sharing God's word. That's what He put in my spirit, and that's what I'm gonna do because it's about Him, and He gives me the strength. The Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I was hanging out and I'll play. <laughs> well, I just I won't go in detail. I just I just fight some allergies. Anyway, before we go forward, apologies on my disposition or my effect. <clears throat> that's a mental health term. I'm gonna move forward because uh, the Lord had spoken to my heart, um, I believe yesterday, and I thought it was a really great word. I want to share it. I want to get it out. So it's from Daniel chapter five. So join me in prayer before we move forward. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word and I thank you for entrusting me with the opportunity to speak it and for putting it in my spirit to share it in the first place. Father, I thank you for blessing me and speaking to my soul, God, reminding me that you are real and just giving me the gift of communication, but also giving me the heart and the ear to hear your voice, God. It truly is a gift to be in touch with the creator of the universe. I think it would be a horrible thing to be a creation of yours and to not be connected to you. So I thank you for giving me the opportunity to connect to you, but to be in right standing with you because of what Jesus did, Father. Father, I'm honored that I'm in a position of being called, but I also am reminded that it is by grace through faith not of works, lest I be able to boast, not of myself. So while I don't take a position of looking down on myself in a demeaning fashion, because you said in the word, I'm fearfully, wonderfully made, and I was made in your image, so I do have value. I recognize that, like your son Jesus said, apart from you, I can do nothing. And so I'm honored, Father, to be in a position of, um, to, to be able to share your word and be a mouthpiece for you, Father, to preach, to prophesy, whatever you would have me to do, to evangelize, to teach. Father, it's about you. And the glory is all is yours and yours alone. And I just say thank you, God, for being more than just someone I read about in the Bible. But you're a living God that exists today. The word of God says you are the same yesterday, today and forevermore. You're never going to change. And I want to say thank you that just like the people in the Bible, you give people today opportunities to experience you in a variety of ways. And I'm blessed that I get to take part in that. I am blessed and I'm honored and I'm grateful. And I pray that you would get glorified in this message that I'm about to bring. In the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, I come to you, Father Yahweh, through your Holy Spirit who seals me for the day of redemption. Amen. All right, y'all. Mm. Probably to drink some water. All right. <clears throat> I am reading from Daniel chapter 5. Here we go. Uh, y'all may not know this story. Many years later, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for 1,000 of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. While they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly they saw the fingers of a human hand riding on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. The king shouted for the enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers to be brought before him. He said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever can read this writing and tell me what it means will be dressed in purple robes of royal honor and will have a gold chain placed around his neck. Sound like a rapper. He will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. But when all the king's men, wise men had come in, none of them could read the writing or tell him what it meant. So the, kings grew even, the king grew even more alarmed, and his face turned pale. His nobles, too, were shaken. But when the queen mother heard what was happening, mama had to come in. She, heard to the, she hurried to the banquet wall. She said to Belshazzar, long live the king. Don't be so pale and frightened. There is a man in your kingdom who has within him the spirit of the holy gods. During Nebuchadnezzar's reign, this man was found to have insight, understanding, and wisdom like that of the gods. Your predecessor, the king, your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, made him chief over all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers of Babylon, this man Daniel, 
whom the king named Belteshazzar, has exceptional ability and is filled with divine knowledge and understanding. He can interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Excuse me. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought in before the king. The king asked him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles brought from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar? I have heard that you have the spirit of the gods within you and that you are filled with insight, understanding, and wisdom. My wise men and enchanters have tried to read the words on the wall and tell me their meaning, but they cannot do it. See, that's what's funny about that. Those astrology and all that, all that mess, excuse me, it's, it pales in comparison to true wisdom from the Lord. Let there be a lesson. That stuff ain't of God. Getting back to the story. I am told that you can give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read these words and tell me their meaning, you will be clothed in purple robes of royal honor. And you will have a gold chain placed around your neck. You will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Daniel answered the king, keep your gifts or give them to someone else. But I will tell you what the writing means. Your majesty, the most high God, gave sovereignty, majesty, and gl glory and honor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He made him so great that the people of all races and nations and languages trembled before him in fear. He killed those he wanted to kill and spared those he wanted to spare. He honored those he wanted to honor and disgraced those he wanted to disgrace. But when his heart and mind were puffed up with arrogance, he was brought down from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven from human society. He was given the mind of a wild animal and he lived among the wild donkeys. He ate grass like a cow and he was drenched with the dew of heaven until he learned that the most high God rules over the kingdoms of the world and appoints anyone he desires to rule over them. You are his successor, O Belshazzar, and you knew all this, yet you have not humbled yourself. For you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have had these cups from the temple brought before you. You and your nobles and your wives and concubines have been drinking wine from them while praising gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all. But you have not honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. So God has sent this hand to write this message. This is the message that was written. Many, many tekel and parson. This is what these words mean. Many means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Tekel means weighed. You have been weighed on the balances and have not measured up. Parson means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed up and was dressed in purple robes. A gold chain was hung around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, was killed and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. It's interesting because I've talked about Daniel in the lion's den. That's after this because Darius the Mede is the one who is, is in reign at that time because he killed this guy. But what am I bringing this up for? <clears throat> Did you notice the disrespect that this king showed the living God? He took these items, these sacred items, and used them in a very common, disrespectful way. You know, he was in his sin and it wasn't enough to be in his sin doing his thing. He had to go and take articles, items that were holy items and sanctimonious items and defile them. And God said enough and he, he brought judgment. Why do I bring this word? Because the Lord put it in my spirit. This day and age, we take God's common grace for granted. We take God who he is for granted. We forget how holy God really is. We take him lightly. Yes, we are under a dispensation of grace, but let's not be forgetting that God still judges. In the New Testament, there were two individuals in the church, Ananias and Sapphira. They both lied to the Holy Spirit and God killed them. The Holy Spirit killed them. Don't forget, God is still holy. In the book of Isaiah, I believe it's chapter 9, the prophet is taken up to heaven and he is in the presence of God himself. And he realizes the holiness of God because he recognizes his own sinfulness. He says himself, behold, I am a man of unclean lips. And he realizes that he is he's he feels he feels fearful. And it takes an angel to come to him to bring a hot coal, a live coal to cleanse his lips. I'm gonna read that to you right now. Man. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Oh, my goodness. You know what? I'm tripping. That's Isaiah 9. That's another script. I think it's Isaiah 7 I'm, I'm thinking of. 
Yeah, here we go. Okay. Oh my word, I am tripping. It's not okay. I'm sorry. It's Isaiah six. Here we go. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim. These are angels. Each having six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundation, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, It's all over. I'm doomed. For I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to him with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of thongs. He touched uh, a tongue, excuse me. He touched his lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, who should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, here I am, send me. And he said, yes, go and say to this people. And then he proceeds with the message. I'm simply getting at, I spit a little bit. We've forgotten the holiness of God and we've taken him for granted and we've taken him lightly. And I encourage you to stop doing that. I don't know if y'all saw a new video with Little Nas. Um, there was a clip of it. He was eating uh, communion bread and drinking the wine in a mocking fashion. And the Bible is very clear that when you drink and eat of the wine, if you drink of the wine and eat of the bread, which is supposed to be in remembrance of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection of his death, how he broke his body on the cross for us, and how he spilled his blood for us. You drink unworthily. You bring, uh, I think, condemnation, judgment on yourself. You can die. People in the New Testament were going through that. And so God was reminding me to remember that God is holy, to show him reverence and respect. I think about the story of um, David when he had had a victory. He was coming in town with Obed-Edom. Um, he was dancing and dancing, and they had the Ark of the Covenant. And they were not treating the Ark of the Covenant with the way that they should because uh, it was a certain ceremonial way of presenting it. And I can't remember if the priests were carrying it or not because that's normally the way, but it toppled. And someone reached out and touched the Ark, and he was not of the priestly line, and God killed him because he had given instructions way back when on how to manage the Ark of the Covenant, which inhabited the presence of the Lord. And God does not play. He loves you, but he is still God. And the Bible says in Hebrews, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the God, of the living God. So don't take God for granted. Don't think, well, he's, I'm saved. I can just do what I want. In fact, the book of Romans talks about, does God's grace give you liberty to continue to sinning? He says, absolutely not. You're not supposed to keep doing that. You're supposed to repent. You turn from your sin. Why do you think Jesus kept saying, repent? Uh, Apostle Paul, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, because God takes sin seriously. He loves you, but there is still such a thing as wrath. And so I just want to emphasize that, not to take him lightly, because that's what we do. We take him lightly. And if you're not careful, you can find yourself in a situation where God has to uh, remind you that he is still holy. He is still God. He is still king on the throne. I'm trying to find that verse. God's mercy is for everyone. Well, that's a good scripture, but I don't have to read that. I guess, you know what? I should just tag it. Anyway, that was impressed upon my heart. You see in that story that that man disrespected God, and he knew the history of what transpired with his father. His father was humbled by God. And even with that and his arrogance, he he it's almost like going to the house of the Lord, the church house and doing some ungodly actions in there, thinking it's all good. The lack of reverence. And so it's unconscionable. And so I just want to say, stop treating God like he's commonplace. He is still holy. There's a song by Ambassador, um, the Christian rapper off his album years ago by, called A Thesis. And he goes, um, you set apart like mom's china plates. You're holy, you've got Shekinah, and you shine your grace. You're an oldie, you go back like rewinding tapes. We worship you. And that song just hits because he reminds us of the reverence that we should have for the Lord. Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's that reverential respect. So don't forget who he is. That's, I think, what I really want to emphasize. Don't forget who he is. He loves you, but he is still king on the throne. When, when Moses came to the burning bush, God said, take your shoes off, for this is holy ground. Don't forget who he is. 
So before I close, if there's anybody watching, if you don't have a relationship with God the Father, you can only have one with his son, Jesus Christ. This comes from a confession of faith and a belief in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that he died and that God the Father raised him back from the dead. If you believe he died and was raised back from the dead and you confess this with your mouth and believe it in your heart, then you will be saved from the penalty of your sins. He took the penalty and the wrath of God upon himself so that you didn't have to. But if we choose to not accept him, then we are basically saying that the debt and the price for sin we are willing to pay and we can't pay that. That's a debt we can't pay. So we end up suffering. And that's why he came to the world. He came. He said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Where is that scripture? I'm going to read something to you. I know this is 63. I'm in Isaiah. I wanted to read about the prophecy of Jesus taking the punishment. I'll have to tag that too because I know it's in 60 something. Anyway, any, any, anyway. Might have been Isaiah 52. All right. So if you want to do that, then simply repeat after me. Let me get back to it. Uh, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. And I believe God the Father raised you back from the dead. And I ask you to come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. And if you meant that, then your name is written in the book of life. You are seated in heavenly places. You are headed to heaven and not hell, because hell is a real place of pain and suffering and judgment. He doesn't want you to go there. But if you meant what you just said, then your name is in the book of life and angels are celebrating. I recommend you get in a Bible-based church and watch God transform your life. Before I go, I want to add something else. This is in Isaiah chapter 52, and this is talking about Jesus. Um, see, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. And he will startle many nations. Nations, Kings will stand speechless in his presence, for they will see what they had not been told. They will understand what they had not heard about. And this is talking about his crucifixion. And it says in Isaiah 53, Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed, whipped. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a, sh a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. That's us. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. That's us. For he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. He did that for us. That's Isaiah 53 and 52. I just wanted to emphasize what he went through for us. The Bible says no one is righteous. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. We're only righteous because of our faith in him and what he did. Nothing we could do to make ourselves righteous. Never assume your good works make you righteous. They don't. It's good to have good works. But if you esteem yourself on being a righteous person based on what you've done, that's self-righteousness and that's motivated by pride. And pride is a stench to the Lord's nostrils. He says he opposes the proud, 
but he exalts the lowly. I think this description says pride is essential is not so much my, my arrogance, but the same thing. My point is, it's faith in Jesus Christ that makes you righteous. And who I just read about was his son, Jesus, the suffering servant. What he did on that tree for you and I, he became a curse so that we could live. I pray this message encourages you, hits you, and takes you to the throne. And like Isaiah, you're reminded, behold, I am a man of unclean lips. But in spite of that, you got a God that'll come like you did with the cold, cleanse you and make you righteous. Don't forget who he is. Much love. God bless. Peace.